Will Nelly, Director of Technology and Innovation for Estes. And by virtue of you sitting here, I see that I have been successful in duping you into joining me really for a discussion on compressors more than it is gas lift operations. Now, before you get up and, and say, ah, this was a sham, I'm and walk out, um, bear with me here and let's address kind of the awkward topic in the room. Now, a compressor guy by training, um, 22 years in the industry, I love compressors. I'm kind of a compressor nerd, but I realize that for many of you, that is not the case. Compressors are really but a necessary evil. And yet, I would propose to you that gas lift is an increasingly popular form of artificial lift. And further, that gas compressors are really key to gas lift. So with that, you kind of have to put up with us, right? You have to put up with gas compressors. Now, if you don't like compressors, much more so do you dislike the environmental regulations that come along with gas compressors. When you start hearing things like EPA, NSPS, Quad OB, Quad OC, Greenhouse Gas Reporting Program, Subpart W, your mind goes numb. I get it. If you have to read the regulations, your eyes bleed. It's, it's a, a nuisance to most of us, and yet it is a reality, right? So my, my goal in today's presentation is really to take the environmental regulations and take them out of front and center, take them out of spotlight and what you do and kind of set them to the side. We do have to deal with them, but I want to enable you to focus on what you really probably love, what you were trained to do and what you're paid to do, and that is focus on oil and gas production and optimizing of that. Let's look at an oil and gas facility from a bird's eye view, really from the perspective of an OGI camera, an optical gas imaging camera. Now, whether or not you are familiar with looking at these images and analyzing them and studying what they tell you, pretty easily you can see a couple of different what is known in the industry as plumes, or you can see the gas that is being emitted from various places on this facility, and there are pretty quickly you can identify three, one of which is from the compressor, and that's what we want to focus on today, is the methane emissions from the compressor. Now, if we study the emissions from, the methane emissions from an oil and gas facility, uh, pretty quickly we see that the compressor is a big piece of that emission. Now, I realize it's hard to see, maybe, maybe nearly impossible, but what I want to propose to you is that the compressors really are a non-trivial component of the methane emissions from the oil and gas production process from, from those facilities. Now you may say, you know, well, we've done some studies internally and, and the numbers that you have up here are lower or higher. I don't want you to get caught up on the numbers, but I want you to just realize, hey, methane emissions are significant from compressors. We can't stick our head in the sand, we can't ignore them, we can't make them go away. They are a real part of what we do. And you have to have a compressor for gas lift operations. They do emit methane. We have to do something about it. So let's look at those methane emission sources from the compressor. I've ordered these in what most people tend to understand from greatest to least in terms of the volume or the flow rate, blowdown, pneumatic actuators, compressor rod packing, or the engine crankcase blow-by. And, and generally that is ordered by, hey, what do you hear most in the industry? What do you hear perhaps in society or in different reports? And while I agree with the different sources, when you look at those by putting a pencil to the paper and going in and do some calculations, I would just rearrange those and reorder them. And what you notice are what were previously the bottom two items flip-flop with the top two items. 
So I mentioned putting a pencil to the paper and, and looking at those in greater detail. So the, the numbers that I show here would be typical from a, a, a roughly 750 horse compressor package utilizing a four stroke rich burn engine driving a four throw reciprocating compressor. Now, what I want you to focus on here are not the absolute numbers, but rather the, the relative values and how they compare to each other. So the numbers that a lot of people hear in, in industry reports and from EPA would be blowdowns and pneumatic actuators. But when you look at those numbers, they're really pretty insignificant when you compare them to the engine crankcase blow by and the compressor rod packing. So what do we do with these? Well, I, I want to look at the components of the, the, the leak sources, where the, where the methane is coming from. And my goal here is not to make you an expert on how compressors work or the components or where the leaks come from, but, but maybe just to give you a, a quick perspective on what they are and some of the nuances of it, and then that'll give us some ideas on how we deal with it. So first, the engine crankcase blow-by. Most compressors have an engine, a natural gas fired engine, and they have this leak that we know as blow-by. So blow-by is when you have the combustion gases out of, your, out of your cylinder contained by the piston, and those gases leak past the piston, past the piston rings into the engine crankcase, and ultimately are vented into atmosphere. Blow-by is a normal part of any engine operation. It's a normal part of a natural gas engine on the compressor packages. It's a natural part of a diesel engine. It's even on your automobile. If you buy a brand new vehicle off the lot, you drive it off the lot, it will have blow-by. So whether the engine is new or it is used, you will have blow-by. Blow-by does tend to increase as the engine ages, but don't think that, hey, we can just go replace the engine and my blow-by is gone. It exists on every new engine there is a steady venting of these gases from the engine. If the engine's running, blow-by occurs. And typically, blow-by is handled by just venting it to the atmosphere. Similarly, on the compressor side now, we're, we were talking first about engine, now we're talking about on the compressor frame, the compressor rod packing. So in a compressor, you also have a cylinder and it has compressed gases inside of that cylinder and similar to the engine, we're trying to seal those gases into the cylinder. And the seal that we're, um, does that work over here on the right side in the, in the green box, the compressor rod packing, they are also an imperfect seal. So where you have gas in the compressor cylinder, it will leak out. It is a steady process, it happens all the time, 24-7, 365. And like the engine, the easiest way, the traditional way of dealing with these emissions is just to vent them to atmosphere. Now lastly, I would bring up pneumatic actuators. So a pneumatic actuator is just a device that actuates or turns a valve or moves louvers on the compressor. You're, we're just taking the energy contained within the, the pressure of the gas and we use it to make a mechanical movement. So over at this diagram on the right, we're talking this area in yellow. There is a space that when you fill it up with natural gas, pressure, pressurized, well, I guess it doesn't have to be natural gas, but in, in this case, mostly it is. The valve moves, opens the valve, or closes it. Now, what's different out of pneumatic actuators versus the engine crankcase blow by and the compressor rod packing leakage is that the, the gas contained in the pneumatic actuators tends to be in a small volume and it tends to be a batch process. It is not a continuous leak, but rather small volumes of gas that leak kind of intermittently. And so the overall contribution, like we saw earlier in the slide from pneumatic actuators, tends to be very small. It's not nothing, but it is very small. So, what do we do with these leaks? How do we mitigate them? Well, previous and, and really even current attempts 
for pneumatic actuators would be to install a air compressor on site. You buy an industrial air compressor, you set it on your oil and gas facility, you distribute that gas out to your suction control valves, to different pumps, and you say, hey, instead of using methane, I run them on air, air escapes into the atmosphere, which is air, and I don't have a problem. Or alternatively, we can take off the pneumatic actuators and replace them with electric actuators. Both of those methods are effective. They're very commonly in use. The downside is that they tend to be expensive. And what's troublesome or, or, or challenging about that is we're really spending a lot of money to deal with a very small leak source. Let's jump to the rod packing. A normal way to vent or to deal with rod packing is to vent it to the atmosphere. For the operators that tend to be a bit more proactive, some will vent rod packing to a flare. So we're not venting methane to the atmosphere, but to a flare which are increasingly regulated, right? There's increased pressure from industry, from regulators to put out the flares, to put out the candles. Um, others will use a vapor recovery compressor. And so while a vapor recovery compressor is pretty effective, it is yet another device, one oftentimes that is rented. It is a mechanical device that'll fail. So um, an option, but maybe a, a mediocre option. Uh, finally, current attempts at dealing with methane emissions from engines of the, the, the blow-by would predominantly be vent those gases to the atmosphere. By and large, engine crankcase emissions are largely uncontrolled. They are undealt with. So I would turn your attention now to this diagram over on the right side. I realize that it is very difficult to see, and the point isn't that you follow everything that's going on, but rather to highlight that this is a 2022 patent. So a fairly recent patent titled Methane and Emissions Reduction System on a natural gas compressor package. And out of that, we see that part of the solution in this patent would be to vent some of those emissions to the atmosphere, or in another part of that patent would be a vapor recovery or a flare, so sending some of the emissions. So even a modern day, a very uh, current relevant patent, some of the solution is still dealing with emissions by venting them to atmosphere. Now, it, to be sure, the, the, the goal, and, and I think in practice, those methane emissions are reduced, but there are still emissions going to atmosphere. So what I'm trying to bring, bring forth is that a new approach is still needed. Enter CVAC or short for Compressor Emissions Evacuator. And this is a system, a patent pending system that my company has developed beginning in about 2021 to deal with fugitive methane emissions off of compressor packages. Let me jump to a little bit larger slide here to kind of describe what the system is and how it works. We'll start over on the left side of the screen and notice emission sources. These are the different emission sources that we've already talked about. The compressor rod packing, the pneumatic control devices, scrubber dump valves to be more specific, engine crankcase blow-by, cooler louver actuators. All of these sources of methane that are just being currently vented to atmosphere on most packages, we are collecting in a volume which happens to be already present on the compressor package we know it is the engine crankcase, and then ultimately, all of these sources make their way over to the engine intake system. In other words, all these leak sources are burned as fuel gas. We're not burning them in a flare, we're not sending them to some other site to be dealt with in some other way, but we are turning them into mechanical energy on the compressor process. Now, we do bring that first through a oil mist separator, and the point is that any gas fed into the engine needs to be in gaseous phase. We don't want to decrease the engine reliability first by 
bringing oil mist or bringing condensed liquids in. Let me show a picture. Many of us are, are visual learners and we like to see pictures. Um, so I'll, I'll show a picture of kind of the, the main part of the system. It's scattered all over the compressor package. And so to the untrained eye, when you look at a compressor package with CVAC installed, it can be difficult to see. But again, I will start over on the right side of this, uh, this image with these fittings connected to the compressor crankcase. That is collecting vapors first from the pneumatic actuators, which make their way into the compressor crankcase, and secondly, to the compressor cylinder um, blow-by. Those make their way into the engine intake I mentioned by way of this oil mist separator. They are first joined by emissions from the engine uh, crankcase and ultimately through this, what we kind of joke of internally is a watermelon colored device. This is our oil mist separator and cleaned up and we tried to show that to visualize it by the green piping connections making their way ultimately to the engine intake. So here I depict a picture of our first commercial installation of the CVAC system. Um, as I mentioned, the CVAC system itself is hard to see from an untrained eye. It is not this skid over on the right side. This is a separate skid to deal with blowdown methane emissions, really beyond the scope and, and not the point of this presentation, but we'd love to talk to you about that. If you want to come by our booth afterwards, um, we'll sell you as many as you want. But um, joking aside, the, the point here of, of showing this picture is I mentioned that it's patent pending and people may ask, well, gosh, that sounds great. I, I love the idea, but are these actually running? Have you proved out the concept? And so this was installed in 2023, the beginning of 2023. And now we have about 50 of these out running in the field with a, a pipeline of, of several hundred more. So they are amassing hours. And we are very pleased to receive some feedback from some of our um, kind operators who've been willing to share their feedback. And I won't read this to you. I'll let you do that. But what I want to point out is that they are going out and doing their LDAR, their leak detection and repair surveys by way of OGI cameras, the optical gas imaging that, that allow us to kind of see methane. And they say, we're not seeing any leaks. We're not finding anything. So we got real excited about that and said, and asked ourselves, all right, well, what do we need to do next? You know, we're, we're stopping the leaks, but, but surely there are some more data points that customers are going to want to have. And we realized that one of the questions that we're gonna receive from operators, and we do, is, okay, cool, that sounds real good, you're, you're stopping the leaks, but how does the EPA view this? Do, do they acknowledge, do they accept? Is this system certified? And EPA doesn't tend to be in a mode of going out and certifying systems, but we did turn to a third party environmental regulatory company who knows the regulations, who reads this, and have them look at our system and say, hey, compare our system to what the, the regulations, the quad OBs, the quad OCs, the greenhouse gas reporting program, the subpart Ws, interpret those rules for us and look at our system and do they overlap, do they meet? And, and really what I wanna point out to you is they say, hey, CVAC meets these rules. CVAC enables operators to deal with these rules in what we call a closed ventilation system. So we've taken all of the leak sources, we've closed that system up, they are not able to escape to the atmosphere any further. And then finally, I would move to kind of our last data point, the engine exhaust emissions testing. So some people say, great, that makes a lot of sense. We've seen similar technology on automobiles. You take the emissions from the crankcase and you burn them in the intake, but doesn't that mess up the engine emissions? Do we just shift the problem from leaking methane into the atmosphere to leaking methane through the exhaust. And so we had a third party emissions testing company come out and we ran through a series of tests where we had our engine operating or the, the engine operating with our CVAC system, normal operation. 
and then we would put it in a different configuration. We had a guy go press a button for the scrubber dump valve, which introduced a methane leak, if you will, into the engine intake. And then we had two and three, and we disconnected the engine and we disconnected the compressor. And we tried to put it in multiple different configurations from fully operational to partly disabled to completely non-functional. And so the data here that I wanna point out would be the NOx and the CO, the nitrous oxide and the carbon monoxide emissions from the engine post catalyst. And what you see here is a, a relatively small change from fully operational to not operational at all. And what may be helpful in interpreting this data is looking at the federal emission limits and comparing the two. So a federal emission limit of NOx one gram per brake horsepower hour is roughly equivalent to 200 parts per million, or for carbon monoxide, two grams of CO per brake horsepower hour is roughly equivalent to 700 parts per million. So in this first line of NOx, we see 15.36, 11.6, so on and so forth, compared to 200 parts per million we have stayed far, far below any of the federal emissions limits in any of the configurations, and, and we see a similar thing on the CO. So we just really look at this data and smile and say, this system is doing exactly as we have intended. So what do we take away from this? Well, first, in, um, we see that compressors are the source of methane emissions to the oil and gas production process. We can't ignore that. I would like to make it go away. Even with electric compressors, some of these sources don't go away, right? Electric compressors still have compressor rod packing emissions, so they are not going away. We have to deal with them. Um, current compressor package mitigation um, systems, they really leave a lot to be desired. But CVAC offers operators a way to eliminate these methane <coughs> emissions. Further, it allows you to comply with federal emissions regulations. And, and ultimately, what I really want you to take away here is that CVAC allows you as an operator to focus on the oil and gas production process. You don't have to get distracted by, oh gosh, what am I, I'm, I'm gonna have to go design a flare system or I'm gonna have to install a vapor recovery system and in dealing with all of these extra things, gosh, really, I just wanna focus on oil and gas production that's what CVAC enables you to do. So let me stop here, open the floor for questions. So we do monitor crankcase pressure on, on the compressor. We've put a transducer in, and that is one method. Of, among other things, we have installed that to make sure that we don't blow out seals. But, but the bigger thing is really to allow us to monitor, is the system operating properly? And Say, for instance, a compressor rod packing starts to increase in its leak rate. We will see that then in an increasing pressure in the compressor crankcase, and then we can dispatch a technician and say, hey, something's going on, let's go diagnose what's happening, and then kind of reset the system, make the necessary repairs. Very valid question, thank you. Sure, so CVAC right now is intended predominantly for a natural gas fired compressor package. Um, the, the main mechanism that CVAC operates under is drawing those emissions into the engine. However, we've developed kind of what we've called internal our electric CVAC, and we install a compressor, another compressor on the skid to draw in those emissions and then re-inject them back into the process. Okay, sure, valid, valid question, and it is one that we receive, especially for production engineers or facilities engineers that are familiar with engines and compressor packages, and they say, well, gosh, you know, some of the gas that is going through compressors tends to be, you, you see some heavier hydrocarbons that could potentially condense out and dilute the oil, and does that decrease the reliability? Do you open yourself to failures? And, and the biggest answer that we have for that is that there is a thermostat on the compressor crankcase which is elevated enough to revaporize any liquids that would condense out and potentially dilute the oil. And so we validated that by several years of 
um, oil analysis and oil reporting. And, and we just see that the elevated temperature of the oil in the compressor crankcase handles any of those concerns. Okay, so you asked about how the gas leaks from the compressor rod packing, and there was one other. Through the, the engine blow by the two main ones, how, what flow path does that take? I don't know if you want to show Sure, I, it may be actually a little better visualized in our, our actual diagram here. So these fittings over on the right side of the screen, the red fittings, those are tied into the engine crankcase or, or the, I'm sorry, not the engine crankcase, the compressor crankcase or the, the compressor block, if you will. So the rod packing would be right kind of over here, kind of to the bottom and to the right of these fittings. And really a fitting is disconnected from that rod packing. And then now any venting, any leaks, if you will, from the rod packing makes their way directly into the compressor crankcase. And then from the compressor crankcase, we install these fittings that would collect gases that would um, collect in the compressor crankcase and they would be taken by this tubing line up to the top of, again, what we joke about, our, our watermelon colored vice, the oil mist separator. I think you may have also asked about the engine crankcase. So most engines, all engines have a breather. They have a kind of an open hole with maybe a, a bit of a, um, a separator and then this hose normally just dangles down in front of the engine and vents those emissions to atmosphere. We, in, in this case, literally take this hose and reroute it through a closed system to the top of the oil mist separator. Knowing what each operator is doing, you most have taken different approaches, but uh, I would say in general, in the cases that we've looked at, yes, um, there are various commercial models we, the, the preferred commercial model is to, in, that Estes would install this equipment on Estes compressors, and then we would do that at no cost to the operator, extending out the, the length of the contract, right? So our, our goal is, is long, if you, if you will, sticky contracts, right? So that, that's been one commercial model. Um, we have sold these systems, but even the cost of when we sell this system, I think you would find would be below the cost of actually purchasing that industrial air compressor. Right, so I, I'm not an emissions guru. Let me, let me throw out that disclaimer first. It, it makes uh, me shiver as much as it does you, but my recollection of subpart W is that now operators are required to monitor methane emissions to the atmosphere and even to go in and replace packing annually. But by installing CVAC, in other words, a closed vent system, the, the EPA makes a provision now for under that closed vent system that you can go back to changing packing um, as, as desired by the compressor company or by the operator and simply to do an annual kind of status check on whatever that system is. So for us, you asked earlier about the compressor crankcase pressure. We have a monitor to say, hey, is this system operating properly or not? And if we can go back and demonstrate that, then the operator, the, the, the requirements for the operator to replace the packing and to go in and do um, volume measurements, rate, flow rate measurements are, are eliminated. Sure, so you're, you're right. In, in the actuator uh, it itself, those are supplied with 20, 30, sometimes I've even seen as high as 70 PSI. But as that is vented into a large crankcase, that pressure you know, in such a small volume expands to probably nearly atmospheric pressures. And, and keep in mind too that the gases that are emitted into the compressor crankcase are constantly being drawn off by the engine vacuum. So in practice, what we see is that the compressor crankcase is held at a, a negative pressure, a slight vacuum compared to atmosphere. 
That's correct, and it's it's difficult to to depict that because there are tubing lines. I mean, it's almost kind of like a, a spider or an octopus. There's just kind of tentacles and lines running to every which place. But there would be tubing lines from the first stage scrubber, the second stage scrubber, the cooler louver actuator, and they are all tied into the compressor crankcase. So truth be told, there's nothing magic about using the compressor crankcase as a as an accumulation volume, except that. It's already present. I mean, we could we could put another tank on and take up more space and add more cost. But as you bring up, we're, we're trying to do this in a cost effective way. We don't want to say, oh, well, you know, you can have this system, but it's going to be prohibitive. So we've been trying to be very thoughtful in our design of this system to make it affordable. All right, well, with that, I will conclude this presentation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll put up a pretty little picture, but more importantly, a QR code. If you have questions, if you want to see the system demonstrated, um, we would be happy to do that. My company does have a booth here. We'll talk to you more about it or connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to talk more. So thank you again for joining.